All of this to tell you that I saw a China that was very Sun Tzuian. They wanted to pursue their interest in peace. They did not want war. They wanted to pursue their interest in strategic competition with the greatest economic power in the world. You could say that certainly after the 19th Party Co Congress, even Xi Jinping wanted to surpass that power. And incidentally, they will. They already have in purchasing power parity. So yeah, the real measure of anybody's economic might. So it's just a matter of a few years before they will, you know, on the chalkboard, they'll be the number one economy in the world. Unless something drastic happens, always a possibility. But everything for them was strategic competition, which they thought they had every right to be in. And we had every right to be in and may the best man win, the best state win in this case. That was their approach. And that's why we came up with a continuation of the previous administration and the previous administration of that's policy of strategic competition. And we helped them as much as we could to be on a level playing field, like bringing them into the World Trade Organization and so forth. Um, now that's all being repudiated. Big mistake, huge mistake. We are creating our own worst nightmare. We're forcing China to deal with us as if we were a traditional status quo great power slipping from the top of the hill, no question we are slipping, and that eventually, and because of that slippage, we'll blame somebody and go to war with them. This is a very dangerous thing to do. History screams at us that it is from Thucydides to the British Empire. And it, I, I don't know why we're doing it. And I welcome the people. I do know why we're doing it. It increases the military budget. That's one reason. Second, it gives Lockheed Martin and others every hope that they'll continue to sell all these merchants of death weapons. Um, that's why we're doing it. And we need an enemy. We've got to have an enemy. We simply have to have an enemy. That's so, that is so requisite in imperial rule that it, it just screams at you out of all the history books. We have to have an enemy, we have to have an enemy. And this time we might want to, maybe we'll throw Russia in too and accuse them of forming an alliance so we can really have a formidable enemy. Now I'll call your attention to an article by a fellow by the name of Mike Sweeney. This is a scenario that scares me greatly. If we went to war with Russia, let's say, on the Ukraine border in any fashion, conventional or otherwise, we'd lose. We'd lose the opening battle and we'd lose it in such a stark way, we'd have 10,000 dead Americans and dead Norwegians and others in a matter of 48 hours. That's what real war is. We haven't been in a real war for a long, long, long time. And by the way, we haven't won a war in a long, long time. Same thing with Taiwan. We would lose the opening battle. We would lose it badly. We'd lose an aircraft carrier or two. That's five, 10,000 souls dead instantly. What would we do, Mike asks? Would we sit back and say, we're the stronger economy ultimately if we get our act together. We're the stronger governmental system if we get our act together. We're the stronger culture if we get our act together. Um, let's just keep going. We'll win this struggle eventually. No, Mike says, we'll go nuclear. That's very scary. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right, and that that speaks to uh, some of some of uh, Dan Ellsberg's uh, work uh, from the Doomsday Machine. That was certainly the the plan. Uh, the, the PSYOP plan back in the 1960s, if uh, any, any for, divisional forces between Russia and the United States went to war, the plan was to go nuclear, not just against Russia, but against China as well. Uh, they didn't have a plan uh, to do something limited. It was uh, all out nuclear war. Um, and, and that's what concerns us uh, greatly. Uh, as you said, history is screaming out to us not to go down this path. Uh, it doesn't end well. Uh, but uh, I'd like to get your comment a little bit on the domestic uh, uh, political situation uh, here in the United States, in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the beginning of this month, the U.S. Senate 
uh, uh, passed uh, a bill that was characterized as uh, as anti-China, bolstering competitiveness uh, with China. And uh, very strangely these days, that passed with bipartisan support uh, in the U.S. Senate. I believe it was 68 to 32, the final vote, with every Democrat, not counting Bernie Sanders, uh, uh, voting for that bill. Uh, and there's a specter of another anti-China bill uh, being led by Senator Menendez uh, that you mentioned uh, that is right on the horizon. Um, so uh, could you comment on those pieces of legislation and, and why is anti-China one of the few things that uh, the Republicans and Democrats can get together on? You just characterized briefly a phenomenon that I'm seriously worried about, and that is that we have become so polarized in our domestic politics that we reach out and yearn for such issues. If you will recall, Franklin Roosevelt, even as Hitler rolled over Europe like a juggernaut, couldn't get Americans interested in the European war. It took an attack on Pearl Harbor and a huge strategic era by Adolf Hitler declaring war on the United States in order to get the American people enthused, if you will, about going to war with Hitler. Today, it's a very different phenomenon. We've been at war now for 20 years, but most Americans haven't a clue because they have no, no skin in the game, none whatsoever. Less than 1% of America has served in the armed forces in the last 20 years. Um, so, this is a very dangerous time, and it's a dangerous time for the reasons I've pointed out, plus what I've intimated, and that is that you grasp at things that unify people. And one way you can unify Americans, as we saw vividly after 9-11, is to bloody them or, or tell them they might be bloodied, tell them that they might be overcome, they might be overthrown, their whole government and everything else. So you get the Putin, Xi Jinping, perfect people out there to fulfill this manifesto and to make sure that you can do this. And you never think, and this is so typically American in our imperial age that it hurts, you never think that you might be creating a self-fulfilling prophecy and that you might not come out the other end. You might indeed be forecasting your own demise. And yet, if you look at the history of empire, that's precisely what empires do. Time, since time, 5,000 years, that's what empires do. Now, some of them find off-ramps, like Britain did, for example, after 56, and they become a middling power rather than an empire. France, to a certain extent, too, although the vestiges in Cote d'Ivoire and Mali and so forth of France's empire still, and still haunting the world and haunting the people in those countries, too. Um, but it's, it's so typical that you just sit back and scratch your head. And if you're an academic and looking at it from an academic point of view, you want to laugh. But you can't laugh because the results are so heinous and so disastrous, so catastrophic. Laughter is not the right recipe. Yeah, well, it's the problem of, of hubris, uh, as you mentioned, which, which goes back goes back to the ancient Greeks, 